Hey y'all, before we get started in this, um, I would like to say that this book is a product of its time period. Um, the trip is being taken around the world in 1872, um, or will be taken in 1872, and the and as such, a lot of the language um, that is used for for lack of a better word, the brown people around the world is not necessarily um, what we would think of as acceptable in in modern world, in the modern world. Um, they do not use the N word in here, but they do use um, not necessarily words that we would choose to use um, in like the modern world. So um, be aware of that. Um, as we will see shortly, um, the trip will take place and move throughout almost exclusively British colonies, um, not through France, but um, for Egypt and India and Hong Kong. And um, the Americas were not a, a British colony at this point, but they had been anyway. So um, anyway, I just wanted to offer that caveat before we get started. So here we go. This is our original audiobook reading of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. This video will encompass chapters 3 and 4. This is chapter 3. Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions. He repaired at once to the dining room, the nine windows of which opened upon a tasteful garden where the trees were already gilded with an autumn coloring, and took his place at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side dish, a broiled fish with redding sauce, a scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese, the whole being washed down with several cups of tea for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one and directed his steps toward the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunky handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with this delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next task, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading room and sat down to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later, several members of the reform came in and drew up to the fireplace where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan and Samuel Fallington, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gautier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which comprises the princes of English trade and finance. "'Well, Ralph,' said Thomas Flanagan, "'what about that robbery?' "'Oh,' replied Stuart, "'the bank will lose the money.' "'On the contrary,' broke in Ralph, "'I hope we may put our hands on the robber. "'Skillful detectives have been sent "'to all the principal ports of America and the continent, "'and he'll be a clever fellow "'if he slips through their fingers.' "'But have you got the robber's description?' "'asked Stuart. "'In the first place, he is no robber at all,' "'returned Ralph positively.' "'What? A fellow who makes off with fifty-five thousand pounds? No robber? No. Perhaps he's a manufacturer, then. The Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman.' It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course, he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed at the mercy of the first comer. 
A keen observer of English customs relates that, being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile, the cashier had not so much ra as raised his head. But in the present instance, things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, pick detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Havre, Suez, Brindisi, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five percent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band. On the day of the robbery, a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and with a well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives, and some hopeful spirits, of whom Ralph was one, did not despair of his apprehension. The papers and clubs were full of the affair, and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit, and the Reform Club was especially agitated, several of its members being bank officials. Ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain, for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity but Stuart was far from sharing this confidence, and as they placed themselves at the whist table, they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together, while Phileas Fogg had Fallington for his partner. As the game proceeded and the conversation ceased, excepting between the rubbers when it revived again. I maintain, said Stuart, that the chances are in favor of the thief, who must be a shrewd fellow. Well, but where can he fly to? asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. Pshaw! <laughs> Where could he go then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added, handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. The discussion fell during the rubber, after which Stuart took up its thread. What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller? Certainly, returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller since a man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago, and that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed, and also why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg. But the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished said eagerly, You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller, so because you can go round it in three months, in eighty days interrupted Phileas Fogg. That is true, gentlemen, added John Sullivan. Only eighty days, now that the section between Rothal and Allahabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened, here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph. From London to Suez via Montsenis and Brindisi, by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay, by steamer, thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta, by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong, by steamer, thirteen days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama in Japan, by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco, by steamer, twenty-two days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days. From New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days. Total, eighty days. Yes, in eighty days, exclaimed Stuart, who in his excitement made a false deal. But that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phileas Fogg, continuing to play despite the discussion. But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull up the rails, replied Stuart. Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage vans, and scalp the passengers. Horribly racist, sorry. All included, calmly retorted Fogg, adding as he threw down the cards, two trumps. Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up and went on. You are right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically, practically also, Mr. Stuart. I'd like to see you do it in eighty days. It depends on you. Shall we go? 
Heaven preserve me, but I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible, on the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. Well, make it then. The journey round the world in eighty days? Yes. I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense. <laughs> it's absurd, cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. Come on, let's go on with the game. Deal over again, then, said Phileas Fogg. There's a false deal. Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand, then suddenly put them down again. Well, Mr. Fogg, said he, it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it. "'Calm yourself, my dear Stuart,' said Valentin. "'It's only a joke.' "'When I say I'll wager,' returned Stuart, "'I mean it.' "'All right,' said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others, he continued, "'I have a deposit of twenty thousand at bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it.' Twenty thousand pounds?' cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds which you would lose by a single accidental delay?' "'The unforeseen does not exist,' quietly replied Phileas Fogg. But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. But in order not to exceed it, you must jump mathematically from the trains upon the steamers and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump, mathematically. You are joking. A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager, replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. I will bet twenty thousand pounds against any one who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept? We accept, replied Messrs. Stuart, Fallenton, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening? asked Stuart. This very evening returned Phileas Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac and added, As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London in this very room of the Reform Club on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m., or else the 20,000 pounds now deposited in my name at Bearings will belong to you. In fact, and in right, gentlemen, here is a check for the amount." A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds, half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. I am quite ready now, was his tranquil response. Diamonds or trumps, be so good as to play, gentlemen. Chapter 4 Having won twenty guineas at whist, and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the programme of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour, for, according to rule, he was not due in Savile Row until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout, repeated Mr. Fogg without raising his voice. Passepartout made his appearance. I've called you twice, observed his master. But it is not midnight, responded the other, showing his watch. I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes. A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's round face. Clearly he had not comprehended his master. "'Monsieur is going to leave home?' "'Yes,' returned Phileas Fogg. "'We are going round the world.' Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse, so overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. "'Round the world?' he murmured. "'In eighty days,' responded Mr. Fogg. "'So we haven't a moment to lose.' "'But the trunks,' gasped Passepartout, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left." 
We'll have no trunks, only a carpet bag with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way. Bring down my Macintosh and traveling cloak and some stout shoes, though we shall do little walking. Make haste. Passepartout tried to reply but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair, and muttered, That's good, that is, and I, who wanted to remain quiet. He mechanically set about making the preparations for departure. Around the world in eighty days? Was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais? Good again. After all, Passepartout, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so sherry of his steps would stop there, no doubt. But then it was none the less true that he was going away, the so domestic person hitherto. By eight o'clock Passepartout had packed the modest carpet bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway Steam Transit and General Guide, with its timetable showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. He took the carpet bag, opened it, slipped into it a goodly roll of Bank of England notes, which would pass wherever he might go. "'You have forgotten nothing?' asked he. "'Nothing, monsieur. My Macintosh and cloak, here they are. Good, take this carpet bag.' handing it to Passepartout. Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it. Passepartout nearly dropped the bag, as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold and weighed him down. Master and man then descended. The street door was double-locked, and at the end of Savile Row they took a cab and drove rapidly to Charing Cross. The cab stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight. Passepartout jumped off the box and followed his master, who, after paying the cabman, was about to enter the station, when a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms, her naked feet smeared with mud, her head covered with a wretched bonnet from which hung a tattered feather, and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl, approached and mournfully asked for alms. Mr. Fogg took out the twenty guineas he had just won at whist and handed them to the beggar, saying, Here, my good woman, I'm glad that I met you and passed on. Passepartout had a moist sensation about the eyes. His master's action touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets from Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. "'Well, gentlemen,' said he, "'I'm off, you see, and if you will examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon.' "'Oh, that will be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg,' said Ralph politely. "'We will trust your word as a gentleman of honor. "'You do not forget when you are due in London again?' asked Stuart. "'In eighty days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before 9 p.m. "'Good-bye, gentlemen.' Phileas Fogg and his servants seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later, the whistle screamed and the train slowly glided out of the station." The night was dark, and a fine, steady rain was falling. Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passepartout, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirling through Sydenham, Passepartout suddenly uttered a cry of despair. "'What's the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'Alas, in my hurry, I—I I forgot—' "'What? To turn off the gas in my room!' "'Very well, young man,' returned Mr. Fogg coolly. "'It will burn at your expense.'" This video is a production of Thomas and Morris Instruction, and the creators of this video would love it if you would like and share and subscribe and comment to help us goose the YouTube algorithm. Thank you for your support.